Since the early 1950s, a rumor has persisted in UFO circles that one or more flying saucers crashed in one of the largest American deserts in Arizona, New Mexico, or Utah. And what's more, according to witness reports, not only did the American army recover remnants of this craft, they also captured some of its occupants. Despite the Army's silence, the mystery has lingered year after year. Should we or shouldn't we believe that aliens were captured? That is the question. The rumor grew as a result of information from various sources, such as Timothy Good, author of Beyond Top Secret. In Beyond Top Secret, I published the story of a Polish biophysicist who, together with a team of French British and Italian scientists was taken to a vault in the JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, where three levels below the floor level, they were shown materials, part of a skull and a hip bone of an alien creature recovered in New Mexico in 1947. They weren't given any further details, but subsequently this Polish biophysicist, whose information I, I use, comes up with some detailed scientific information about uh, what he learned about these creatures. However, despite Timothy Good's opinion, these unverifiable accounts do not constitute valuable proof in the eyes of non-believers. If they can't see and touch an alien, skeptics need more convincing proof than mere empty words. In the midst of ongoing debates between believers and skeptics, something spectacular happened. In the early 1990s, Raymond Santilli, a London-based film distributor, released an archived film that hit the world like a bombshell in both UFO circles and the general public. In the uh, sort of early 1990s, a film came to light, um, brought to the public by a chap called Bray Santilli, who effectively said that he had purchased canisters of film from someone in America who had shot them back in, in the 40s, and that what effectively they revealed was the autopsy of a captured alien at Roswell or at some similar sort of event, and, uh, and you see the eyelids being removed and you see bits of the body being looked at and so on. And, Either, I mean, there is, it has the merit of one thing. Either that is a genuine alien autopsy or it's a fake. There's no argument that this could be some kind of mistake, that it's something else or whatever else. It's either one or the other. As John Spencer said, the film Alien Autopsy fired up debates within the UFO community regarding authenticity of proof. Since verbal accounts of UFO sightings did not seem to be convincing enough proof, some believers decided to hark back to the old adage, a picture is worth a thousand words. Starting in the 1950s, a series of amazing photos began to appear in the press. A photo that was supposed to depict an alien char to the controls of a spacecraft was dubbed Tomato Man because of the perfectly round shape of the head. Upon closer examination of the picture, a pair of eyeglasses could be seen near the burnt body, proving that it was nothing more than a human pilot. In 1982, American UFO researcher Leonard Stringfield published Crash Retrieval's Status Report 3, a document that dealt exclusively with alleged UFO crashes. On page 47 of the document, Readers can see a picture of what is supposed to be an alien hand found by American agents in southern Florida. The famous photo appeared in several UFO magazines before falling into the hands of a photo professional in Massachusetts. Mark Pelliquin had been a medical photographer with Harvard University's Department of Neurobiology for eight years. When I saw this picture of the alien hand, uh, <laughs> It struck me first as a very poor quality photograph. I saw right from the top that it was most likely a, a, a very poor 
copy, maybe first generation, of a um, museum catalog photograph based on what I saw for the lighting and the density of it. Curiously enough, um, it was about that, that time, too, when I saw an exhibit at the Peabody Museum at, uh, at Harvard on um, showpieces from uh, P.T. Barnum. And in there was uh, uh, an artifact that he touted around uh, called the mermaid. Uh, it was, had some obscure origin in the Philippines or something like that, but it was essentially, it was like a fish body with a monkey skull and these hands glued onto it. And the hands looked exactly like the alien hand. Harvard was kind enough to uh, provide me with a photograph, which I sent to uh, authorities who, uh, the UFO authorities, whom I very much respect. And, uh, <laughs> and the alien hand became no longer the alien hand. In the fall of 1990, newspapers published a photograph of what they claimed to be one of the aliens retrieved in Roswell, stating that the picture had been found in the archives of the deceased Dr. Felix Zigo, an obscure Russian UFO specialist. A few months later, a second photograph appeared on the same subject, but much clearer than the first, raising wild speculation in UFO circles. Was it a leak within the Air Force, or a hoax orchestrated by information agencies? Although the origin of the first photo could not be confirmed, the origin of the second one could. In an article published in The Orbiter, American UFO researcher Jim Malesiuk said that he had obtained the photo from Canadian journalist Christian Page. The humanoid in the pictures was nothing more than a wax and latex figure on display in the early 1980s at the Strange Strange World Pavilion, one of the few buildings still remaining from the 1967 Man and His World exhibition. In February 1990, a few years before Raymond Santilli distributed his alien autopsy film, which had allegedly been taped by the U.S. Air Force the day after a flying saucer crashed in the Roswell Desert, American and Canadian UFO researchers began to receive a series of strange documents in the mail. The anonymous author claimed that on November 4, 1989, a flying object of unknown origin had been forced to make an emergency landing in the swamp outside of the small town of Carp, Ontario. Once on the ground, the UFO, still intact, was fired upon by three helicopters sent to the scene by Canadian and U.S. Secret Services, who were working together on this matter. Next, using the nerve gas Vexon, which is not widely known, a commando unit moved in on the craft, which did not fire at them. They reached the controls of the ship, where they found the bodies of three reptilian creatures. Pretending to be carrying out road work near the swamp, the army discreetly moved the UFO to a secret government facility in Kanata under the cover of night. As for the mysterious creatures, they were supposedly secretly transported to the University of Ottawa, where CIA physiologists performed an autopsy on them. This incredible tale was accompanied by the topographical map of the area, as well as a photograph of one of the captured creatures. When he got wind of this amazing story, Graham Lightfoot, a local UFO researcher, headed to CARP to investigate for himself. I went to the area and on a Saturday, thinking people would be home, talked to eight to ten people, I just forget exactly, and uh, asked them had they seen anything over the swamp. So I talked to people who had the best view of that, and nobody had seen anything and I was getting a bit frustrated so where else do I go so I turn and go to the other side of the road and lo and behold found two people who had seen something one uh, turned out to be the Labanex and she told me that a bright light had been seen over the swamp as bright as a arc welding or electric welding at night time and it was at such and such an angle from her house. 
Later on the same day, I was further down the road and found another young, a younger lady who also told me she saw a bright light in the swamp behind her house and uh, disturbed the dogs. The light shone through their windows. So in talking to those people, they didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it was. Interestingly, the story that was given with that, that report that there'd been a crash said that roads had been cut into the swamp to take out the, the downed UFO. And uh, even in the winter when I first looked at that, there was no way anybody had cut a road into that swamp. And, uh, you know, I sort of said, well, that part of it isn't true. Maybe somebody saw a bright light, but they certainly hadn't cut any roads in to retrieve anything from that swamp. Just when it appeared that this matter was fading into oblivion, further correspondence sparked the interest of CARP investigators once again. A year after the first anonymous package was sent, UFO researchers received another one, in which the author identified himself under the pseudonym Guardian, and said that he was a member of the Guardians of the Secrets of the Holy Grail. Other than a new story and various interesting clues, the package also contained a videotape showing a UFO that Guardian had filmed. Graham Lightfoot tells us what was on the tape. One of the things that was sent out was a video, a VHS video. And on the label of that video was the name Guardian, typewritten, with a fingerprint. And that sort of indicated, catch me if you can, or whatever, but a uh, curious way to send something with no, no names. But the documents that came with that also referred to Guardian. There were various documents sent to different people. Some had a story, others had, or in addition to the story, had playing cards with little notes written on there that DND and CSIS is involved and things like that. Uh, very curious, why would you send playing cards? Uh, it, it, it looked like a game. The only thing that made any sense was the background map happened to be the same area of Mannion's Corners that the 89 crash had been written about. The videotape that, that Guardian had sent starts off with flares or some sort of red light, four of them, burning nighttime picture. So it's totally black background with these four flares or red lights. And beside it, stationary, is a large, I'll say a large object. The only way you know there's anything there is the fact that it's illuminated from underneath. And it's a very, very bright, intense light. And on top of this structure, because it, it's apparent something was there, was a rotating or a flashing beacon. That video was filmed by someone holding the camera on their shoulder, presumably, walking towards it. Thinking that it was a hoax, Graham Lightfoot returned to CARP, accompanied by Canadian and U.S. researchers. He later discovered that there was a reason why they were being so helpful. Bob Exler from the United States had been contacted, and he contacted MUFON Ontario, and we all met in Carlton Place, I, and then I led them out to the site. And uh, we, there was about 12 or 14 of us that day. And my thought was that we would knock on doors to see if anybody, would split up the area and knock on doors to see if anybody had seen anything back on August the 18th of the previous year. We started to, we didn't knock on any doors, which I thought was a bit odd, but anyway, we, uh, we did walk around the area. <clears throat> a lot of the chaps were getting hot and tired, mosquito bites and all that sort of thing, and uh, they decided we'd all go for supper in to Carp, to a pub in Carp. Bob Exler and his son Dan, uh, said no, they were gonna find the, the crash site and they were gonna stick at it. Well, within half an hour, they showed up at the pub too. And oh, we found the site. So the rest of the chaps uh, 
were, were not happy with the way Exler was doing things. He seemed to have all the answers, had found the site now, when nobody else even knew where to look for the site. And uh, they more or less washed their hands of it and went home. On the other hand, I only live an hour away from that location, and I was curious enough to decide, well, I'm going to stick with it and see what's going on, see if we can find an answer. And <clears throat> since we had a, quote, expert from the U.S. here, let's see how an expert does it. <laughs> and uh, so we spent the next day uh, going around the area, and I finally convinced Exler let's go and talk to Labanek because Diane Labanek had seen the light from 89. I said, wouldn't it be, make sense to go and talk to her? Maybe she saw something. When we talked to the Labanex and she told us that yes, she had seen this spaceship, she called it a ship repeatedly, she saw fire, a fire in the grass and yet it wasn't moving as it should if it was a, a grass fire. And then she saw a ship or spaceship land, which is what was in the Guardian video. In the Guardian video, it didn't land, it was stationary, it was already on the ground. But Diane told us that she saw it land, and it sat there for a few minutes, and she could see a, a, a lightning strike, sort of a zigzag line on the side of the craft, and the lights and so on. And after a, a short while, it took off. And then when it took off and disappeared, the lights went out, the, the flares. Now, that's her story, but what she described matched pretty closely what Guardian had sent on his video. And at that time, Diane had not seen the video that we had been given. So it made sense that she was telling a pretty good story. As Graham Lightfoot and his colleagues inspected the site, they were unaware that they were being watched by another organization also interested in the mysterious Guardian. Learning that a suspicious character was fabricating documents and attempting to pass them off as official reports of the Department of National Defense, the RCMP decided to carry out its own investigation. The RCMP came to the same conclusion as Graham Lightfoot, that Guardian was nothing more than a charlatan. According to the RCMP, the alleged UFO on the videotape was nothing more than a Sikorsky helicopter filmed in the dark. As for the identity of Guardian himself, Graham Lightfoot suspected that it was a UFO follower who was well known in the area. I think I know who Guardian is. Um, as I say, he's been known in the area for talking about UFOs for forever, for 40 years. Um, he has not admitted that to anyone to my knowledge. I have tried to see him. I've knocked on his door because I know, I think I know who it is. But he won't even answer the door. So I, I think it was probably done as a game. When I say game, it was just fun. It was something to do. Um, can we do it? And uh, looking at the video, I, I'd say they did a pretty good job. Although the second-hand account of the carp incident was fairly simple to solve, others were much more complicated, like the Umo affair, a case so wrapped in mystery that many still doubt today that it could have been a hoax. One of the most ardent defenders of the Umo affair is Professor Jean-Pierre Petit, an astrophysicist and research director for the French National Center for Scientific Research, or CNRS. Petit literally shocked his colleagues in 1990 when he announced that some of his work had been inspired by Umite messages, a collection of typewritten letters that were primarily in Spanish. These letters were accentuated with odd words of so-called alien origin and signed by alleged visitors from the planet Umo. What's interesting is what we do with our lives. I may be the only person interested in the subject of UFOs who published scientific articles in high-profile magazines about 
fluid mechanics, ionized gases, cosmology and geometry. Through reflection, I was able to produce high-quality material. What's published in UFO magazines nowadays is completely different. And I'm telling you that I was very inspired by the UMO letters. Jean Paulion, a computer scientist who was also interested in the UMO documents, agreed that they contained information of alien origin. In studying the Umite letters and the glossary of alien terms used in the documents, Jean Paulion concluded that they could not be a hoax. In his book, UMO, True Extraterrestrials, Paulion explains how he came to this conclusion. When I began working with these letters, I didn't know the theory surrounding them. All I had to go on was the information transcribed by Jean-Pierre Petit, and I wanted to find out more for myself, so I dug into the original source documents. These letters are difficult to read, and important information is never stated directly. It's only found by cross-referencing several of the documents. That means you need to spend a lot of time working with the documents, going through each one carefully and comparing them to each other. These documents were disturbing to everyone, from UFO groups to the French National Space Research Center. No one wanted to admit that they supported this material, and that surprised me. Why was it so disturbing? Because people don't like to be led down unknown paths. Omite material was not designed for scientists or UFO researchers. It's targeted towards highly intellectual people. I have friends who are mathematicians, and when they glanced at the material, they found it interesting and highly intellectual. Just look at the work done by Pouillon, which was not done for amateurs. It was very highbrow. It required thousands of hours of work. So you can't make a judgment on his work based on a cursory glance of it, especially if you don't have the required qualifications. To fully understand the scope and complexity of the UMO mystery, we need to go back to where it all began in Madrid, Spain in the mid-1960s. The key figure involved was Fernando Sesma, a Spaniard who claimed to have been in contact with extraterrestrials from Venus and Mars since the 1950s, as well as other inhabitants of the solar system. Then, along came the Umites. In actual fact, Sesma's group, the Happy Whale Club, existed long before the UMO mystery began. Sesma was interested in extraterrestrials and other esoteric subjects. A group of people would come to listen to him tell stories in the basement of a coffee shop in Madrid, where there was a huge smiling whale painted on the wall. Sesma was contacted by telephone on January 14, 1966. He then began receiving letters confirming the existence of UMO and letting him know that the next Umite craft would be landing in Aluche on February 6, three weeks after the first mail delivery. The letters were sent to Sesma, who spoke about them and mixed up the contents of the letters. Supposedly, the Umites did not appreciate him mixing things up, so they intentionally began adding technical information to make him lose interest. Sesma was a dreamer, not a scientist. So a lot of the technical information was over his head. Once the letters began to be filled with equations, Sesma started to lose interest, but people were still coming to hear about them, like engineer Enrique Biagrasa and Dr. Aguirre. These gentlemen and others began to receive the letters directly, and gradually they formed their own group, the famous Madrid group. They disassociated themselves from the Happy Whale Club, which continued to show interest in esoteric matters such as planets where butterflies laid eggs that hatched baby ducks. That's the sort of thing that Sesma cared about. After two to three years, they were no longer interested in UMO at all. In exchange for a modest sum, Sesma turned over all of his UMO documents to Ferrioles. The Umite mail packages, which bore an emblem resembling a letter of the Cyrillic alphabet, explained that they had been living on Earth since the 1950s. 
They were part of a scouting mission sent to Earth from a planet in the Virgo cluster, and the contents of the letters were designed to help advance humanity. The first Umite packages were received by Fernando Sesma in 1966. He received several dozen letters each year for many years. Over time, the Umites found other human contacts. Spanish, French, British, and even American representatives began receiving these odd packages. The last Umite correspondence was received in the mail in 1995. Something is real until it's proven otherwise. These letters exist. I'm in the process of proving that they cannot stem from a human hoax because of all the ramifications that would involve. The contents of the letters themselves also prove it. I'm telling you that they are alien in origin because I have found strong proof within them to support that claim. They contain 1,345 words and more than 400 expressions, more or less coherent, that correspond to a language system having a base of 18 elements. That's quite something. It's real. And these Umite reports contain scientific information that we have started to study on the Internet. When I say we, I mean a study group that was created to review my work. This group now has more than 100 members throughout the world, primarily university students. Martin Castello co-authored The Star Conspiracy, an investigation into the Umo affair. She was surprised to find that this odd story seemed to circulate under a cloak of secrecy, even among university students. I was a science journalist working for Figaro, and I was in charge of the science page. I had to prepare an article on a scientist named Jean-Pierre Luminet, who had written about black holes. So I went to Moudon to see him. Since he was a longtime friend of mine, once the interview was over, I asked him jokingly, Jean-Pierre, have you ever heard of Humo? He grabbed me, and then he led me into the hallway and said, be careful where you talk about that. Yes, of course, I studied the letters when I was younger along with several other scientists. I examined the letters carefully and I pondered over the equations. I couldn't believe what he was telling me. The next week, I had to give another interview for Figaro. I went to Oxford, or, or maybe it was Cambridge, I don't recall, to see Stephen Hawking, who had just released a new book. Stephen Hawking is a physicist restricted to a wheelchair due to Lou Gehrig's disease. At the end of the interview, I asked him the same question. Have you ever heard of Humo? With one finger, he typed the word yes on the computer. I couldn't believe it, so I asked him if he could tell me more about it. He adamantly replied no and wheeled away. The interview was over. Although some researchers are incredibly enthusiastic about Umo, others see it as nothing more than a very clever hoax. It's true that the whole thing has some suspicious elements, such as a series of photographs of an Umite craft. In 1967, the Umites announced in a mail package that one of their ships would be arriving soon. Then, on June 1, 1967, an airship flew over the San Jose de Valderas area of Madrid. By the strangest of coincidences, a couple of photographers just happened to be at that location and took several pictures of the object. Interestingly, once the pictures were published in a major Madrid newspaper, the two photographers vanished into thin air, as if they had never existed. Jean-Jacques Velasco, director of France's UFO research group, SEPRA, recalls that an investigation was carried out by his predecessor. Yes, this matter pops up now and then. We hear about it in the media. It's quite simple, really. Our UFO research group was called Japan at the time, and our director, Claude Boer, discovered that a number of people in southern France were receiving strange packages in the mail. In these packages, the recipients found photographs of bizarre things happening in the sky. Claude Poer had one of the pictures analyzed, and it was shown that the photograph was nothing more than a model suspended from a nylon thread. An independent investigation led by ground 
Saucer Watch, an organization specializing in photo analysis, confirmed Poher's conclusions. By digitizing one of the photos taken in San Jose de Valderas, the experts had no trouble detecting the thread suspending the alleged UFO. Another controversial element was the quality of the information provided by the UMICs. According to Jean-Pierre Petit, the extraordinary things mentioned in the letters proved their alien origin. But was the information truly ahead of its time, as he claims? For example, Professor Petit said that the first packages from the Umites, dating back to 1962, contained references to parallel universes, which most physicists believe are composed of antimatter. Professor Petit claimed that no one on Earth could have imagined such a concept back in 1962. He used the same argument for magnetic hydrodynamics, or MHD, a principle of propulsion that consists of moving an object within a dense atmosphere by wrapping it in a sort of magnetic cocoon. Petit said that when the Umayyad reports mentioned MHD, it was a highly revolutionary principle for its time. Jean-Pierre Petit's main problem is a question of dates. The first Umayyad letters did not date back to 1962, but rather 1966. As for the scientific information, it didn't start appearing in the Umayyad reports until the late 1960s. Human discussions of parallel universes date back to 1967, when the idea was first proposed by Russian physicist Andrei Sakharov. Same thing for MHD. In 1966, as the UMO affair was just beginning, an American team was carrying out successful testing of a submarine powered by magnetic energy. In other words, contrary to what Jean-Pierre Petit claims, there was nothing revolutionary and probably nothing alien about the Umite reports. The scientific information that Jean-Pierre Petit found in the Umite reports is undeniable and indisputable. It's there. He may have been a bit off with his dates, but what counts is the details of the information that he found. It's a fact that MHD was discussed in the Umite documents. It was just not discussed in the same terms as those interpreted by Jean-Pierre Petit. In my opinion, it was not being discussed as a means of propulsion, but rather as a source of energy. The Umite letters are like a key capable of accessing the reader's intuition. They contain a lot of hidden information, and it took an imaginative mind like Jean-Pierre Petit's to find the building blocks of the ideas being expressed. Researchers everywhere did the same thing. I don't think the Umites gave any explicit explanations, and I feel that Jean-Pierre Petit underestimated the importance of his work. He was able to find two or three concepts in the reports due to his imagination and scientific intellect. What he accomplished was not easy, and it was a lot of hard work. The Umite letters stimulated his imagination. Everything that he came out with was not stated explicitly in the Umite reports. They only gave pointers. The question remains. Who wrote the Umayyad reports? If it's true that they were nothing more than a hoax, then it is generally agreed that they must have been produced by a well-managed organization. But who and why? In 1993, one of the key players in the UMO affair, Jose Luis Jordan Peña, admitted to having written the Umayyad letters. As an engineer, Peña had the knowledge required to have written these reports. But did he work alone or did he have accomplices? Peña's confessions did not convince everyone, and especially not Professor Petit. Dans cette histoire, Peña's confession came at a time when I just received a package in the mail from Saudi Arabia, signed by the Omites, proposing that we meet. Who knows if it would have come about or not, but it was aborted due to an error made by Farios. That was when Peña began acting odd, saying all sorts of things, like the fact that he had written the Omite documents. I was at Rafael Farios' house when he and Peña discussed the matter. They had known each other for about 20 years, and by announcing that he had written the documents, Peña had made Farios look like a fool. So Farios was very upset. You know how Spaniards can get when they're angry. That's when I heard Peña say to Farios, don't be mad, Rafael. The Omites were the ones who told me to do it. Who are we to believe? Aliens flying on a craft suspended from a nylon thread? who order their agents to lie on their behalf to preserve their anonymity? Or Jose Luis Jordan Peña, a man tired of the 25-year cat and mouse game he'd been playing with UFO researchers who had been desperately trying to determine his identity. 
Will we ever learn all of the details surrounding the Umo affair? It may linger on as nothing more than a dream until we get some definite answers, but we never will. The Umo affair is one of life's mysteries, like the quest for the Holy Grail. In the mid-1990s, Raymond Santilli, a London-based film distributor, publicly announced that he had just laid his hands on a film showing an alien autopsy. According to Santilli, the film had been taped by a former U.S. Air Force cameraman who had turned over the 16mm reels. In 1947, this cameraman had supposedly been ordered to tape the autopsy of an alien found in the desert near Roswell, New Mexico. The day after the autopsy, the cameraman developed the film, which was never turned over to the Air Force for some odd reason. Fascinated by such a spectacular subject, TV networks around the world were excited by this rare find. At first, the film seemed to be authentic. Even Eric Gosselin, a special effects technician, was taken in by the film. The first time that I saw Ray Santilli's alien autopsy, I spent several days thinking that it might be real. Because there weren't really any clues that jumped out to say that it was a fake. I didn't notice any electrical wires hanging from the alien's arms. And I didn't see any marks indicating that it was a mannequin. However, shortly after the film was released to the public, several UFO believers began to have doubts as to its authenticity. The circumstances surrounding the release of the film raised serious doubts. Timothy Good is one of Britain's most well-known UFO researchers. He has published several books on the subject of UFOs, such as Above Top Secret. Regarding the um, alien autopsy film, which was presented by Ray Santilli some years ago, I'm convinced it's a hoax. I think it, it, it's suspicious that I was not invited to the original showing of the film, and even months before I tried to contact Ray Santilli, he ignored my requests to uh, see the film. I'm convinced it's quite a clever fabrication done by various individuals, and I'm sure that their names will be known in, in due course. Now, Santilli, of course, maintains that it's genuine and that he's withholding more footage and so on and so forth. He talks about having supplied bits of the film for analysis, but he has never supplied any actual frames from the film for proper analysis. The day after the autopsy film was first shown in 1995, several people claimed that it contained proof that it had been filmed later than 1947, such as the microphone hanging over the autopsy table and the telephone that appeared behind the doctors, which were said to be more recent models than those used in 1947. However, when we organized a private viewing at Bell Canada, Technicians confirmed that the telephone was a 352, a commercial model used as early as 1941. As for the microphone, we checked with the technicians at Shore Brothers in Illinois, who advised us that the model in the film had been available on the market since 1942. In other words, there was no proof that the film had not been taped in 1947. Unable to prove that it was filmed later than 1947, Analysts turned to a theory that it was possibly a clever trick, an argument countered by the exorbitant cost of such a production. Invited as an expert on a television program, Eric Gosselin said that he could prove this objection wrong. On the TV show, I was challenged to recreate the autopsy film, and I accepted the challenge. I created an alien that I had to open up an autopsy, as was done in the Santilli film. Eric Gosler and his brother Carl produced a film whose sole purpose was to prove that Ray Santilli's alien autopsy could be recreated at a reasonable cost. Obviously, I didn't have two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars to invest in my production. On top of that, there was the question of when my version would be aired. I only had two weeks to put it all together. I managed to get it done within the two weeks for less than two thousand dollars. 
Even though they proved that it was possible to produce something similar to alien autopsy at a reasonable cost, the Gosselin brothers in no way proved that Santilli's film was a fake. Further proof was still needed. Santilli was still keeping quiet about the identity of the person who had taped the film. Finally, after being bombarded with questions, the film distributor said that it had been created by Jack Barnett, a cameraman who had also taped initial testing of the atomic bomb south of Trinity, New Mexico. Research showed that only two cameramen were authorized to film those famous tests, and neither one of them fit the description given by Ray Santilli. The British producer also claimed that his film had been analyzed by the Kodak Film Company, who supposedly confirmed that it did indeed date back to 1947. There was something not quite right about this. We got in touch with Peter Nielsen, the person at Kodak's England office who had performed this alleged analysis. He wrote to us explaining that he never analyzed Santilli's film. However, he did admit to having studied a piece of film submitted by the British producer. It was a blank piece of celluloid used to hold the film on its reel. Based on the specific code appearing on this celluloid, Nielsen wrote that it was possible that it had been removed from a film dating back to 1947. He also cautioned that since it was void of any image, there was no way of proving that it had come from the autopsy film. Santilli distributes old American movies and could have easily taken this celluloid from any production dating back to 1947. No one has ever seen the actual film that the autopsy was taped on. Santilli generally shows the film on magnetic media with the pretext that the original reels are safely locked in a vault. He is, however, more than happy to show people the metal cases in which he keeps the reels. One of them has a suspicious looking label. Other than a few mundane markings, the label bears the official stamp of the American Department of Defense. This raises two points. Firstly, if the film was never turned over to the Air Force in the first place, then why does it bear their stamp? Secondly, upon checking with the National Archives office in Washington, D.C., it was discovered that this stamp was not made official by the U.S. president until October 1947, at least four months after the autopsy film was taped. A flaw in the film date had finally been found. John Spencer has written many books on UFOs, including an encyclopedia. For many years, he also headed the British UFO Research Association, or BUFORA, the largest UFO group in Great Britain. Now, I have to say that there is so much evidence that it's a fake that that's where my feeling is. Um, the, the way in which it came to light, the way in which the whole film is shot, it has a certain theatricalness about it. And when we compare it to actual autopsies done at the time and so on, actually it's not that good. Um, it's not the way it would be done and so on. So there's an awful lot wrong with, with that film. The question that, of course, is... is paramount, I suppose, is was Ray Santilli the person who faked it, or was he a victim of the hoaxer himself? And, and on that question, I think the jury's out. In the police world, it is well known that to find a culprit, you need to know who is profiting from the crime. To date, it is estimated that Raymond Santilli has made about $7 million on his autopsy film. P.T. Barnum is credited with saying, a fool is born every minute. If P.T. Barnum was alive today, the showman would certainly be amused to see that one of his exhibits was passed off as an alien hand. The television networks paid several thousand dollars to show the autopsy of a rubber mannequin, and that scientists are poring over letters of questionable alien origin in the hopes of finding revolutionary new ideas. If P.T. Barnum was alive today, he would no doubt be working in the field of UFOs.